Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Brookings. Thank you for coming. For those of you who do not know me, I'm John Thornton, the chairman of the board of trustees of Brookings. This session will be the first of what we hope is a series in which each of the Republican candidates for the White House comes and have a session like this. We did something like this in 2008 with both Democrats and Republicans when both contests were open. Uh, our guest this afternoon, as you can see, is Governor John Huntsman, the former governor of Utah. Today's discussion will focus on the economy, jobs, tax reform, and the budget. Governor Huntsman, in the course of the discussion, will outline his comprehensive plan to create jobs and revive the economy. It's also a great pleasure to welcome his daughter, Abby, sitting right here, and her husband, Jeff Livingston. Um, this is the third time Brookings has hosted Governor Huntsman. We had the pleasure twice before when he was ambassador to China, when he participated in, the, in our U.S.-China strategic forum on clean energy, once in Beijing and once in Washington. As the 16th governor of Utah, John's economic policies were, his signature policies were tax reduction, reducing government, and growing Utah's economy. He also has extensive foreign policy experience. As ambassador to China, as deputy US trade representative, and as ambassador to Singapore, having served under four different US presidents. He has argued foreign policy is critical not only for national security, but also for economic growth. John has been a businessman, a political leader, and a statesman. We're very pleased he's able to join us today the session will take the form of a discussion between Ted Geyer, who's sitting to John's right. Ted, as most of you know, is the co-director of our economic studies program. Before coming to Brookings, he was a professor at Georgetown, and he was also uh, served in the, Bush, in the Bush 43 administration under Hank Paulson of the Treasury Department. So please join me in welcoming Governor Huntsman. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you, Governor, for being here. It's a real honor to, to, be, to have you with us. Although candidate. I approach you with great trepidation now, hearing that I'm the first of the candidates to actually <laughs> show up. There must be a reason nobody else has, uh, has appeared. <laughs> I'll get here. Uh, so let's start off uh, with what I think uh, arguably is the most pressing problem we face, which is the labor market problem. We've lost nearly 9 million jobs to the Great Recession. Uh, we've had some job gains in the last year, but not even enough to keep up with normal job growth. So we are, at best, treading water pretty much been flat at around 9% unemployment, 4% long-term unemployment. It's really a staggering problem. One number that one of my colleagues points out is if we were to get 200,000 jobs per month, which we haven't been getting, but if we were to get that month after month after month, it would still take 12 years to get back to where we were uh, pre-recession. So just to start off broadly, kind of on your plan and what you, what you envision, what role is the, does the federal government have to kind of help us dig out of this enormous pr uh, problem? What, what would you advocate as president? When I learned as governor, uh, I, I would apply as president. And that is a leader through the levers of policymaking can influence a state or a country's level of competitiveness. So we did that in the state of Utah, a great state. Uh, we made it number one in job creation. Uh, we uh, made it the most attractive destination for business. Uh, we worked on innovative education policies, uh, job training uh, programs. We looked at what we needed to do in our state to compete in a region, the western region of the United States, in ways that would set us apart from, from others. So when you, when you stop to think that, you know, the brain power leaving your state, which we saw the year that I was, a lot of people were talking about it, going somewhere else. You know, if you're a state and your college graduates are leaving, that's a bad sign. That's your, that's your intellectual firepower uh, for the future, your, your intellectual property development. If your entrepreneurs are not active, if investment is not landing in your marketplace, then it's landing somewhere else. So capital is a coward, you've got to argue. And it will flee wherever it perceives there to be risk in the marketplace. And if it's not landing in your marketplace, it's going somewhere else. It wasn't landing in our marketplace. So what to do? 
you've got to create uh, an environment that speaks to the attraction of brain power, because it is a, uh, a, a fungible market. You've got to create a marketplace that speaks to the attraction of capital. And so we kind of looked at where we wanted to be. You know, Utah's a unique state. It's not California. It's not New York. But you've got uh, natural resources. You have geography. You've got a terrifically uh, well-educated, talented workforce. Uh, you, have a, you, have, you have a commitment to the firm, which was uh, what I heard from a lot of people. Very loyal, uh, very, very, very loyal people. And you had a real entrepreneurial streak in the population. So how do you free that up? So I got together uh, a group in the run-up to our election of 2004. Dozens and dozens of business leaders, stakeholders, academics, to say, if you had to choose 10 things to revitalize the economy, what would it be? You know, it can't be 100 things. That you, the bandwidth isn't such that you can get that done as a leader. But it can be 10 things, or five things, or three things. And let's prioritize them. So we did. And I came up with, uh, with a 10-point plan. And uh, we enumerated those 10. We kind of attached uh, the underlying uh, assumptions to them, what it would mean to the marketplace in terms of economic uh, revival. And it kind of started with tax reform. We had a, kind of an, an old-fashioned system. I used to describe it as you know, a, a, a dilapidated, anachronistic system from the 50s, kind of a 1955 Chevy traveling on the 21st century superhighway. And if you're going to try to compete with, you know, with the likes of Colorado or Idaho or Texas or other, you got to do better. So we came up with a tax reform program. We failed our first time before the legislature. We succeeded the second year, uh, and we delivered essentially a flat tax. We phased out loopholes and deductions, not in total. I wasn't able to get all of them out. That was my going in position. I wanted all of them gone, even though that's politically treacherous, uh, particularly you know, home interest deduction. You know, nobody wants to talk about that. I said, I don't want it. If you want to buy down the rate, you've got to raise the revenue. Uh, you've got to raise the revenue, reinvest it in the code, and get the rate down. Uh, broaden the base, lower the rate, and simplify. But what we did produce was better than we had before. But what it did, as much as anything else, is that it infused a sense of confidence into the marketplace. People talked about us. People started writing about the Utah market. <coughs> Forbes, Fortune, you know, people come out and do articles. They kind of have a marketplace on the move. And that kind of had a reinforcing aspect to it. Entrepreneurs become more active. Investment begins to flow inward because you're all of a sudden a hot market. And, uh, and, and uh, brain power is attracted to your local university, which we found uh, it becomes a more attractive place to be. Revenues uh, increased. We were able to you know, triple the rainy day fund. We were able to make investments in our state that up to that point we just couldn't, we just couldn't think about. Uh, we, we couldn't have afforded like paying teachers what I thought they were worth, uh, which is far beyond what they're getting today. Uh, uh, putting innovative programs into the classroom, like early childhood development, expanding uh, choice. Uh, and then at the higher ed level, coming up with some centers of excellence that would attract brain power. I learned serving on the Singapore Economic Development Board in the 90s. Uh, their, their lesson of economic development, which was you know, open the floodgates for brain power. You've got to lower tariffs and barriers, open the floodgates for brain power, bring them in, give them something to do, level the playing field, and try to stay a step or two ahead in terms of economic competition, which they've always which they've been able to do. I thought, you know, in Utah, we can stay ahead of the competition. We just have to make sure our, our environment, our competitive environment, is, is conducive to attracting the, the elements that an economy needs for success. So I say this is totally applicable nationally because we need to infuse a sense of confidence into this economy. Uh, there's capital. There are great ideas. There we've got the most innovative, entrepreneurial, uh, creative class the world has ever seen. They're still here. They want to be set free. They want, to get, they want to get after it. But there's not a level of confidence today that is compelling companies to unleash capital expenditures into the marketplace that isn't uh, uh, inspiring uh, folks to hire, to bring people on, which gets to joblessness. And I say we must, in this country, create an environment that speaks to 21st century competitiveness. It's not going to be easy. You can't do it overnight, but I am convinced that we can take some early steps that would move us in that direction. Attracting capital, attracting brain power, 
Now, why is all this important? From a macroeconomic standpoint, it is important because I think we have an opening here in terms of rebuilding our manufacturing muscle in this country. A lot of people say, those days are gone, can't do it again. Listen, when I was born in 1960, we exported three bucks for every two bucks we imported. You know, we own 36% of the world's GDP. 25% of our GDP was manufacturing. Today it's nine. I say, we have an opening here. Why? Because China's GDP is going from eight, nine, ten percent over 30 years running to what will be more four, five, six percent in the years to come. And with that will be higher unemployment in China, which always carries with it an element of political uncertainty and instability. Lar uh, larger itinerant workforce roaming the countryside, coming into the city centers. And that investment that always just kind of knee-jerk flows into China for manufacturing purposes will be looking for an alternative. And we would be stupid in this country if we didn't say we're going to be that alternative. And we're going to address the defects, the deficiencies in our competitive environment, and we're going to win that investment here. It also assumes that you have a president who can sit down with the Manufacturing Alliance, the Chamber of Commerce, the Business Roundtable, and say, folks, I know you've got capital expenditures planned for all corners of the world, but I have a request on behalf of all the people of this country. We want you to do it here. I want you to go back to your boards of directors. I want you to think again about where you're going to deploy these capital expenditures. And I want you to do it here because we're going to rebuild our manufacturing muscle. And in exchange for that, I'm going to fix taxes. I'm going to create a regulatory env environment that is conducive to predictability and growth. And we're going to take steps toward energy independence, the three most important engines of growth that I think we have before us in this country. Could I just get a, uh, I want to dig a little bit deeper because you mentioned tax reform both in your history and in your proposal now. <clears throat> uh, your plan is essentially endorsing one of the Simpson Bowles fiscal commissions. They, they have kind of an array of uh, tax rates you can choose from. And, right. and getting at this trade off you talked about, you could have lower marginal tax rates, but in order to fund it, you've got you've to eliminate some of these tax expenditures. And I think in your plan, it's the three brackets 8%, 4%, and 23%, which is a substantial decrease in marginal tax rates. I guess the problem is the frustration is very frequently you've seen this with these commissions. They come out with, the, I can count at least three of these commissions, all come out with reasonable plans, I have to say, and then they get kind of chewed apart or kind of nibbled on on the edges. And the, each one of these tax expenditures has kind of an ingrained constituency. And so you get a lot of political figures say, hey, this is a great idea, but not the mortgage interest deduction or not the earned income tax credit, for example. So even in the Simpson Bulls, in order to get those low rates, in order to fund it, they're suggesting get, that would have to be funded by an elimination of earned income tax credit, child tax credit, full taxation of capital gains at ordinary income. I mean, this is, I don't know which one of those, you, uh, mortgage interest deduction, are you, are you dedicated to getting rid of all tax expenditures in order to get those marginal tax rate reductions, or are we back into kind of picking and choosing, and, and unfortunately, then that's where the deal sometimes falls apart from a right. budget point of view. The Simpson-Bowles plan, in fact, the work that was done by Simpson Bowles, uh, I laud. Uh, I think they did an excellent job. I, I think agree. the president made uh, a fundamental uh, tactical error by throwing it in the garbage can. Uh, why? Because it was done in a bipartisan fashion. You know, maybe the, some of the numbers were a little off from where I would have put them. But on tax reform, you have to assume that this has got to get through Congress. And that's why I say I look at what my colleagues are doing on the presidential campaign front. 999 doesn't start anywhere because who in Congress is going to want to see a 9% uptick in, uh, in state taxes? Romney kind of nibbles around the edges. Uh, Perry has got a flat tax, which we delivered to the people in Utah. But it's an option. It still sort of retains the current code. So if you're gaming the system based on loopholes, you'll continue to game the system. And I say, all of that is nonsense. We either think big, we're either bold at this time when our nation needs it most, or you don't do it at all. So you say, if you're going to take that step toward a bold proposal, you've got to at least pass the straight face test in terms of what can be done with Congress. So it's not laughed out on day one. I say, I'll take something that's been looked at from a bipartisan standpoint. You know, these guys have some good bipartisan minds who have looked at it. They've analyzed it. Something is there that, uh, that, uh, that, is, that, that is to like. Second of all, you know, I say, if the Wall Street Journal comes out, the most respected editorial page on economics in the country, uh, maybe the world, and they say, Huntsman, that crazy guy, this economic proposal is the best of the bunch, I say, there is an opportunity we have 
to bring together a, nece a, a, a necessary coalition, bipartisan coalition, because in the end, that's how you have to get it done, and to move this thing through Congress. And my going in position would be, I want all loopholes and deductions gone, sensitive as some of them might be, and as politically treacherous as some of them might be. I say, you know, it's a negotiation. You've got to get the work of the people done. You've got to start someplace. And that, you know, that's my gripe about today's world. We're not doing the work of the people. We're off camped out in the extreme ends of politics, finger pointing, uh, and engaging in, in hypercharged partisan rhetoric. We're not doing the work of the people. So I say, if you're going to do the work of the people, you've got to put something on the table that uh, at least stands a chance. So my going in position would be loopholes, deductions, gone. Now, that'll be a negotiation at some point, and that'll be a fierce negotiation, no doubt about it. But you've got to have a position going in that speaks to where you think you want to be. Because in the end, you've got to raise enough revenue through phasing out loopholes and deductions to reinvest it in the code such that you can get the rate down. So I'd love to you know, end the exercise right where I put it on the table, which would be 8, 14, and 23 percent. It doesn't have the sound of 999, I admit, <laughs> but it's, it's doable and it's achievable, and it cleans out the cobwebs. And I think we need a cleaning of house, So absolutely. Let me just get, so it, let's take it at, that it's the beginning of a negotiation, which I, I think is a proper way to do it. Everyone, these negotiations have started. <laughs> it's, it's where they finish, that frequently is the, is the problem. And it, maybe you can clarify, and you can speak for the Republican position on this. I think one of the challenges is very, very frequently the Republican candidates or politicians say, well, we don't want a tax increase, but it's unclear what is meant by a tax increase. Some people say we don't want a tax rate increase. In fact, we want a lower tax rate. And others on the party would suggest we don't want any tax revenue increase, which would suggest no elimination of tax expenditures are not enough to make up for the marginal tax rate reduction. In the negotiation, how far are, we go, are you willing to go if you're going to do this trade-off of you know, some, some of these marginal tax rates are going to maybe not be able to uh, or these tax expenditures are going to be added back in, which means you have to increase your rates. Right. On net, are you looking for a tax revenue neutrality? Are we looking for increasing tax revenues through tax reform? Is it a diehard position one way or another, or is that, again, something we negotiate and we compromise? You go into with certain principles. You can do it on a revenue neutral basis. That uh, would be one of the principles that I would abide by. Second of all, I'm willing to raise revenues that uh, are anathema to some people, both on the uh, individual income side and on the corporate side by phasing out corporate welfare. We, just, we can't afford it anymore. And I think it gums up and distorts the system such that we just need to get smart about the 21st century. Phase out subsidies. And uh, I would then, re now for some, going that far is, is, is too far. Uh, but that would be one of the principles uh, by which I would guide tax reform. Reinvest it back into the code and allow that to lower the rate uh, and, and take it forward in, in that sense. But I would also use uh, a bipartisan coalition, if you could put one together to help drive it home, such, such as we saw around the, the, the Simpson-Bowles Commission. I would use the business community to help make the arguments about what this means to job creation. Because I think in the end, if you can make a valid argument about what tax reform means to refiring our engines of growth around job creation, that argument's going to carry the day. Because to prime the pump, we need jobs. We need to expand our economic base. We need to pay the bills. We need to provide more in the way of opportunity. So that's the, that's the, that's the theme that must prevail throughout. We're doing this because we haven't touched taxes since 1986. We're doing this because our leading competitor countries, many of which I've lived in before, they've cut They've dealt with taxes, they've dealt with market opening measures, with trade liberalization. We haven't. We've got to act or we're going to see the end of the American century by 2050. And that's a price too high for anybody to be paying. Uh, so if we, if we start, let's say we're at tax, uh, it's tax revenue neutral on a tax reform panel and it has uh, grant you the economic growth consequences of a lower marginal tax rate. But nonetheless, now we've got an expenditure, expenditure side problem because uh, if it's revenue neutral, as we know, our, on the expenditure side, we are increasing at a, a drastically high rate. And the, the key contributor or driver there is going to be the future, a future deficit is going to be the mounting cost of Medicare. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, increasing longevity, which of course is a good thing, retirement of the baby boomers, and the continuing increases in the cost of health care. So I'm going to overly simplify and maybe offend both sides of this debate. 
But my oversimplification is the left looks at this and says, we can get this under control. If you point, a bunch, if you point experts, you give them political independence, they pick what the most cost-effective means are of, of uh, cost-effective medical procedures that Medicare should cover. Everything else you have to do out of pocket, that's how we're gonna actually get sensible uh, restraint on Medicare. And on the right, again, oversimplifying a bit, we're gonna do a voucher. We're gonna grow that voucher at a fairly low level, lower than it's been historical trends have been for healthcare growth. And that's gonna keep it under. Again, simple, you don't have to buy my simplification, but broadly, we do have to buy the fact that if we are revenue neutral on tax reform, we gotta do something on the expenditure side. And mm. undoubtedly, that's on the Medicare as the biggest component of that, of, of, of our future growth. Mm. What is your vi vision of kind of Broad broadly of, of, uh, of uh, uh, reducing expenditures on uh, pr primarily through Medicare? First, we have to start with the uh, assumption that all options are on the table, that if you're going to do this and do it right, which is to say target four to six trillion dollars over 10 years, which you have to do, uh, we, we have no choice. I mean, as I look at the numbers, it, it's, it's a painful exercise, but you know what? As a country, we have no choice. You know, you hit the wall. If you don't do it right, then by 2020, just based on current uh, revenue forecasts, you've got Medicare, you've got Social Security, interest payments on the debt, and that's it. You're out of gas. Sure. And I say, you know, we can't, we, we can't not act. We've got to do something. So everything on the table, including Medicare, including the Department of Defense, it's got to be there. And I say what <clears throat> Paul Ryan has put on the table for Medicare uh, I think is valid. Uh, I think uh, it's, uh, it's a realistic approach. The premium support system, not a voucher that he talks about, the, the bifurcation at age 55, uh, above which uh, the status quo prevails, below which we have uh, a defined contribution marketplace, which uh, I think is where we, need, where we need to go. We need to figure out overall how to take costs out of health care. I don't mean to oversimplify it, but when you figure that this is a $3 trillion industry, and any expert will tell you that half of that number, $1.5 trillion, is superfluous, needless spending, that's where you start. You've got to say, how do we begin empowering the patients so when they walk into the doc's office, they know what is available, they know what the costs are, they know what the options are, they're not walking into an office where a foreign language is spoken in which they're completely confused, because in today's environment, nobody knows what health care costs are, not the patient, not the doctors. So we somehow have to get our arms around the cost drivers. And uh, this is all kind of a backdrop to Medicare, but totally relevant because in the, in, in the longer term, over the longer term, I think it it'll all will mean something. But uh, we also have to recognize that the world in 1965 was different than, than it is today. Uh, and in terms of eligibility age, I think we can move that out. Uh, perhaps even a means testing component, mm -hmm. as I would say with uh, Social Security, which in 1935, you know, the average age was 61.7 years or something thereabouts. So the assumption was you work for 40 years, you take out two, that's a pretty good deal. And uh, today we're upside down. You know, you work for 20, you want to take out 40, doesn't, doesn't work. The rate of return isn't 8%, it's more 2 to 3% return. You've got fewer people paying in than taking out. Moreover, we're living longer. I mean, what is the one thing we've picked up since 1900, thanks to science and medicine? You know, we picked up three decades of life, somebody born in 1900 versus born today. And I say, we've got to somehow fix the underlying assumptions on Social Security for inflation and tie it more to real wage growth as opposed to the consumer price index and have a means testing component with maybe a th the top third wage earners in the country where it phases in at a different pace. I think you can, you can deal with a big part of the problem by doing that. It's a shared sacrifice. I mean, the president's gonna to have to call on the nation to step up and recognize that it will be a shared sacrifice. And beyond that, I think you can push out eligibility age to maybe the 89th, 90th percentile of the average uh, length of life on a, on a sliding scale. I think between those two, we can save Social Security and we can, we can deliver on the original intent and promise back in uh, 1935. So I, you know, this is all about leadership. It's about uh, political will, but I believe it's the will of the people, the will of the people in this country now to get our debt and our spending in line with that which is sustainable, something more 19% of GDP as opposed to 23, 20, 24%. It also has to be made into an argument about national security. 
for me, that's an argument. And that is when your debt becomes 70 percent of GDP, soon to be 80 percent, whatever that number is today, you just don't grow anymore. And when you don't grow, you can't compete. There are some, there are some competitive aspects to this that really do make it a national security argument for the American people. And then you look around the bend at where Greece is at 170 percent debt to GDP, or Italy 120 percent. And I remember in my negotiations with Japan 10 years ago, when I was the lead negotiator at USTR, uh, non-performing loans, structural barriers and impediments, the Koretsu system that made it absolutely impossible to start new enterprise there. Today, they're entering their third decade of lost growth, third decade. And I say, look around the bend, folks. If you don't want to address the debt and spending, you know, you can kind of see where it takes you over time. I want to just shift gears just uh, one more question before I open up. <clears throat> uh, you obviously have extensive experience in China, so just a little bit of a change of pace by asking about China. But it is a campaign issue. Governor, Governor Romney, as you know, I think he said this would be his first day as president, said he would list China as a currency manipulator and that he would assess duties on Chinese imports if they didn't float their currency. And this is something a bill went through Congress essentially, or going through Senate, I think it passed the Senate, essentially saying the same thing. Uh, 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 proposing to impose tariffs on China over exchange rate issues. I'm wondering, what do you think of such policies? And just broadly speaking, given your experience in China, what are the promise and maybe possible perils of, of strong economic growth in China for the U.S.? Well, first of all, let's call it what it is, is pandering. You know, it sounds good and you can get an applause out of the group when you say, we're going to slap a tariff on China, we're going to go to war with China. The reality is far different. So you're going to take it to the WTO. What are you going to do with the WTO? There's no provision for a, 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 a case on currency. And second of all, you start you know, slapping on a tariff, and the Chinese are going to turn around, and they're going to say, remember the quantitative easing programs, part one and part two? You did the same thing. So here's a tariff on you guys. Now, why do I say this? Be because I lived through the 421 tires dumping case in China about three years ago. And I thought, this is not a good thing, but you know, the president has to do what he wants to do. Uh, and so what happens after the penalty was assessed at, I don't know, can't remember what it was, 1.7 or 2 billion bucks. The Chinese came up with a similar, analogously valued <laughs> countermeasure toward our chicken parts, yeah. completely disrupting our, our, our ag sector, our poultry producers. And that's just the way the game is played these days. So recognize the reality. And we're back to the United States and China sitting down in a negotiation and grinding it out because it isn't a unidimensional relationship. It isn't just about currency. You can't just hit them on currency and expect that you know, to, to, to be it. You're, it's three-dimensional chess. I mean, you've got North Korea. You've got weaponization in, in, in Iran. You've got the Pakistan element. You've got South China Sea. You've got global economic rebalancing. You've got uh, uh, new energy technologies. You've got a whole lot of things that you're trying to carve into a broad-based dialogue with the Chinese. So I say, like it or not, you're left with the reality that you've got to sit down and grind it out at the negotiating table. Same thing I think that President Reagan discovered. Uh, I, I see Mr. Kalb here who will remember those days. Um, I, I went with President Reagan in the early uh, 80s to China. He campaigned in 1980 on, uh, I believe it was withdrawing our diplomatic recognition from 1979 and re-recognizing Taiwan, uh, only to find once you become president, that even back in those early days, you know, to get things done, you've got to factor in the Chinese. And uh, it's a relationship now that will require, going forward, a dialogue at the presidential level that is consistent, that is uniform, that is done a couple of times a year, not something that's on the margins of APEC, not something that's on the margin of G20, but a consistent dialogue that lays out our strategic interests in the region and allows us to pull out their strategic interests and have a much deeper dialogue than heretofore we've been able to achieve. That'll be the future of the relationship. And through that, trying somehow, some way to infuse shared values into a relationship that for 40 years has been based on shared interests. Mm -hmm. We trade, we invest. We do all the, all the economic stuff, a little bit of regional security work. But we need a whole lot more in the way of shared values blended into this, to give it the staying power 
that we're going to need for the first and second largest economies in the world if we're going to make this a relationship it can be, despite all the challenges that in inevitably we will have. And that'll be broadening the dialogue on political reform now that the fifth generation is coming to the forefront of the 18th Party Congress next year, along with a more nationalistic, more hubristic view of the world, by the way, which will carry some challenges for us. We need to expand it around human rights. We need to expand it around things like the role of the internet in society, uh, religious liberties. These are all things that we should be expanding our debate around. Why? Because you've got a whole young generation of folks coming up, 500 million internet users, 80 million bloggers who are having these discussions anyway. Uh, you've got the, the raw material in China increasingly to have these discussions and to have them picked up and taken seriously like never before. Because the party is reading the blogs, they don't like what they're reading, clearly, uh, and they know they're gonna have to make some accommodations in the years to come to open up and to further liberalize. If not, there's a train wreck in the making. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be providing a little bit of intellectual context to all of that. Terrific, what do you say we open it up? Some questions sure. from the crowd. I think we have mics also, right here. Uh, thanks. Uh, Governor, I'm Garrett Mitchell, and I write the Mitchell Report, and I want to <clears throat> ask you a question about uh, um, the one thing we really haven't talked about today, which is, um, uh, among others, I guess I should say, uh, you, you make a very persuasive case about what should be done uh, in the realm of economics uh, and fiscal policy, and your experience at USTR and as governor and, and ambassador in, in China, of course, suggests that you, you bring a lot uh, to the table uh, on that equation. Uh, but if you were to become president, um, what, what changes is you come to um, a, a town and meet something called the Congress. Uh, and it, it, we know, I think it's fair to say, we know for a fact that Rule 22 in the Senate, uh, the stranglehold that the Rules Committee uh, has in the House, uh, the extent to which uh, regular order uh, has become um, a, a, an oxymoron <clears throat> up on the hill suggests that no matter how well prepared and how thoughtful uh, the next president of the United States uh, is, he or she is going to have to deal with an institution that holds the purse strings and, and, is, um, and is really um, in, in a in a, in a state that makes it difficult for good governance to take place. I'd be interested in hearing you talk about uh, two things. One, uh, the extent to which you've thought about those structural problems that the Congress deals with. And the second and more important one is, what role could a president and presidential leadership play in bringing some change so that uh, governance could, could, uh, good governance could have a chance in the country again? We have to figure out ways to enhance trust in the system. I don't have an easy answer for you. But uh, when I was reelected, I see Tommy Burr back here with the great newspaper. He'll remember. When I was reelected uh, in 2008, we got just shy of 80% of the vote. Uh, the turnout among the young people was such that I was a little discouraged about the future of our system. And I thought, what do you do? to enhance believability in our democracy, to get kids, younger generation folks, more invested in our future. And what is driving the apathy? Is it campaign financing? Is it the role of lobbyists in society? Is it ethics in government? Is it lack of term limits? Whatever the case might be. And we put some people to the test to kind of gin up a report that would outline maybe some steps that could be taken. Uh, shortly thereafter, I was taken to China. I don't know whether there was a connection to that report or not. But uh, I think the same thing needs to happen with uh, the next president. I think we first and foremost need to build a level of trust in the system between the people and who they elect. And the fact that we're running on empty today between the people and the institutions of power concerns me greatly. Congress, the executive branch, Wall Street, we're running on empty as it relates to trust, which is a precarious place for this country to find itself in. And I say, whatever happened, you know, you can get all the policy stuff right, but how do you build trust in the system? 
that's got to be a conversation that we have as a people in this country. And 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 and